Base is dropped on a new week of SDH, the soccer's morning show. John here, Jared there. Maddie Cruz on the ones and twos. Maddie will be drifting in when she darn well feels like it because she has those kinds of executive controls. Sorry about 906. Morning, Dell. Now that uh, the USL Championship and League One season's underway, we've got news out of League One that happened this morning. And it has to do with the particular tournament that League One has put together this year. So there's news out of League One. We got stuff. We got guests. Plenty to play with. And so I guess uh, since we are officially in a no dilly, no dally zone, morning, Alex, uh, let's go ahead and roll into opening kickoff. Brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. That's your QR code for those of you who are watching us, uh, however you are watching us. It could be on the 280-character app, could be on our Twitch account, and it could be on the YouTube channel. So uh, plenty of ways to uh, catch up with us this morning. And the first thing we're going to talk about is Jarrett in Turkey. Um. There, there are rivalries in, in Turkish football. I mean, Galatasaray and Fenerbahce is the biggest one on the board. Uh, the fans in Turkey, they really don't like each other. They, they just don't. And when you have uh, matchups involving fans and fan bases and teams winning and they celebrate in the middle of the field, you end up with what happened with uh, Fenerbahce and Trabzonspor the video is out there, and I'm see, I will see if I can find it in, in short order and post the link. But for those of us that you know deal with prem and proper, we might remember Mishi Bachuai from his time at Chelsea. So Fenerbahce, that's where he is now. Fred scored twice. They win it three two. They are at Trabzonspor. So Fenerbahce celebrates in the middle of the field at Trabzonspor. Trabzonspor's fans get a little bent out of shape. Actually, a lot bent out of shape. So they decide to charge the pitch. And it got so bad and so out of control that we can take our counter, we can take our billboard, and reset it to zero. Zero days since stupidity down here. Trabs on Spores supporters, they stormed the pitch. They tried to confront Fenerbahce players. Didn't go so well. So, Bright Osai Samuel, who played for QPR in Blackpool, he was, there's a still frame, there's a still photo that's out there where Osai Samuel literally has, uh, after I'm assuming, I don't have the other previous photographs shown, but Osai Samuel is basically waylaying a fan who is on the ground who apparently went after him first. Then you see Mishi Batshuayi on the media that is social attempt a spinning back kick. Literally, he's trying to leave. Looks like the fan's trying to exit. Batshuayi does a spinning back kick and almost hits the dude flush. It's like he brushed his upper chest and hit him you know, a little in the face. And so security, security, they helped out and they got Fenerbahce stars back to the changing room. Ismail Kartal condemned the scenes on the website. Turkey's interior minister went ahead and tweeted after the match. Identification efforts regarding the spectators entering the field and an investigation into the events that took place after the match immediately launched. launched. Sports is above all sportsmanship. It's never acceptable for violence to occur on football fields. The public will be informed. The only thing missing I'm thinking is the wagging finger. The public will be informed about the incidents. About the developments. Sorry, my bad. Johnny Infantino, who who felt compelled to uh, watch and comment as well. The violence witnessed after the Turkish Super League match is absolutely unacceptable. On or off the field, it has no place in our sport or society. I've said it before, and I will say it again, without exception, in football, all players have to be safe and secure to play the game, which brings such joy to so many people all over the world. I call on the relevant authorities, once again, the only thing missing, I think, is the finger wagging, to ensure that this is respected at all levels and for the perpetrators of the shocking events in Trabzon to be held accountable for their actions. 
And that was posted to uh, Johnny Infantino's Instagram account. So suffice to say, he was less than pleased. And he's going to earn, by the way, $4.6 million in his next uh, yearly cycle for salary, getting a raise of 33%. So he got up a third. So I guess he went from like three and a third to 4.6. Mazel tov, Merry Christmas, and Happy New Year. So there you go. So, uh, Jared, that's opening kickoff. Don't challenge Mishi Batshuayi or run onto the field because you never know what's going to happen. Well, I like the fact that he tried to line the guy up, like straight <laughs> up too, man. Like you could see him, like you, you just saw the gears working in his head as he just kind of peeks over his shoulder like, okay, I want to time this out. <laughs> and it doesn't connect. Not no. Really anyway. Um, no, no. Uh, it, and once again, don't fight pro athletes. <clears throat> it's the best advice I can give you because yeah. had he connected oh. – um, had he truly connected, oh. uh, we'd have much bigger conversations on our hands. Um, yeah, Dell, this is so unlike Turkey. <clears throat> um, <laughs> I will always point back to the piece. I don't even know if it still exists on these here internets. Mm-hmm. That uh, back when SB Nation actually somewhat paid people, they never really paid people. Back when they somewhat paid people, <laughs> yeah. um, they sent Spencer Hall to. Oh. A uh, to a match in Turkey and had him cover a, a derby there. So I you know, always recommend that just because his tur- his turn of phrase was very appropriate mm-hmm. for doing a oh god, I forget. I think he went to Galatasaray. I think uh, in Fenerbahce. Yeah, I, I think, think it was Galatasaray right. and Fenerbahce he went to. I think you're right. Um, yeah, I'll always recommend that because uh-huh. they were all just unhinged. Uh huh. Um, that's like your that's like your yeah. line when it comes to uh, uh, so who are you for Rangers or Celtic? Mm, yeah, Park, Queens Park. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you run a 50-50 chance of uh, becoming acquainted with Mr. A Knife. So yes. just Queens yeah. Park. That is true. Yes. So uh, that's opening kickoff. Brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee. Don't mess with professional athletes, especially in Turkey. There's yep. your code. Damn, found it. It does still exist. Thank God. Oh. I just, I look, man, I don't trust SB Nation not to wipe all the good stuff they've done off these internets. Yeah. Yes. <sighs> so there's your QR code for those of you who are watching, however you're watching us on the YouTubes, on the Twitch, or on the 280 character app. Don't forget to use the code Soccer Down Here 15. You get 15% off your purchase. They in turn take 10%, reinvested into youth initiatives and the uh, youth programs that they have earmarked very very cool stuff from our friends at kickoff coffee and kickoff coffee co.com okay we've officially filibustered to close enough to 9 15 so you know, we know what that means we now bring in abe gordon on a monday and so abe abe survived the late night that was atlanta united and orlando city as always my friend welcome on a monday yeah thanks for having me it's it's uh three more points so i can't complain much uh you know when you look at the match in and of itself for Orlando City, the purple team, they came in. It was somewhat rotated. Formation was a construct as opposed to something that we're traditionally used to. But obviously, then when the ball drops, everything goes sideways. Uh, from 30,000 feet, now that you have had a post-game show and you had the chance to sleep on it, what are some of your big thoughts from 30,000 feet after the full points for Atlanta United yesterday? Yeah, a couple of things that we expected going into the game maybe did show themselves. Obviously, Orlando City ha- had a midweek trip uh, similar to New England a week ago. So could could you take advantage of some tired legs? Uh, and, and then you mentioned the formation. I mean, they're missing two mainstays in their midfield, one because of injury, but the other because of a red card suspension. And, and so you took advantage – of that you had Saba uh flipping ends quite often uh and so he was moving around and it, obviously the guys that needed to do damage did damage I mean it was interesting because in the opening goal it, it was a situation where Yakamakis probably could have been a little selfish and try to take on a defender and go to goal himself but uh Unlike the outside of the left foot that scored a week ago, it was the outside of the right foot that throws Saba in on net. Uh, and then obviously that game, or excuse me, that goal uh, from Yakamakis in the second half, it's just unsavable. Um, you know, once again, going to be in discussion for goal of the week here. And so 
Um, look, it, it was weird when you look at the the numbers, the statistics. Um, some of those things I believe in, some of those things I don't believe in. But ultimately, uh, shots on goals were were uh, what mattered, and goals themselves were what mattered. So it, this was a pretty good performance. First clean sheet as well, and, and that's something I talked about last night in the post game show. Is we came into this season talking about Atlanta United potentially being one of the most explosive offenses in the entire league. Maybe we didn't put enough. Uh, discussion into, hey, with some of these new additions, what are we going to see defensively? How are they locking down back there? Because you're now three games in with only two goals allowed uh, in your first clean sheet. And it it is looking like a a serious factor, the potential to be able to win both offensively and now maybe defensively, something we haven't seen in a couple seasons here for United. Jarrett Smith, first question for Abe Gordon on a Monday. Uh, yeah, I guess looking at how that game went, what was your thoughts on the fact that it was it wasn't the it wasn't like the New England game. There was a lot of grit and sandpaper in that game. What do you take away from winning a game like that, which isn't necessarily pretty? Yeah, I, I, you probably didn't play the way you're designed to play, right? I, I, I mean, there were certain aspects that you kind of let Orlando City get away with, and, and then you found your chances. And when you had your chances, for the most part, there were a couple opportunities that you didn't convert. But for the most part, you made them count. And it, it was a very interesting game because it it didn't feel like a ton of it was played in the middle third. It, it felt like they were up top with us or, or we were up top with them. But th- this was a game that once you got the early lead, and, and that's the other thing, is you could just throw all all of it out the window once you score in the ninth minute. Like, like it all goes to nonsense because they start pushing way earlier uh, than they normally probably would have and things open up earlier. Uh, and stuff like that. And we were we were asking for an earlier start. I mean, you did get a first half goal a week ago, but it didn't come till almost first half stoppage time with that Almada PK. Once you score in the ninth minute, it, it, it kind of changes things. And then, um, you know, the other thing about this is it is a rivalry game, but it was a rivalry game played with uh, fill-in officiating. And eh, there were some questionable moments in terms of how the game was controlled from that aspect. Um, but it, it did settle down a little bit in the final 30 minutes because it, w- it was getting to be something where um, I thought a card uh, of the red variety was going to be shown at some point. Yeah, uh, Jarrett and I were discussing the idea, especially late in the second half, the way that uh, CCH was calling the match, that this was not going to end 11 v 11, and you had instances like the the Gregerson the, the Gregerson push from behind, I want to say it was Dalton McGuire, uh, who pushes Gregerson from behind deep in the attacking third inside. Oh, I think it was right on the edge of the six. Gregerson goes down. There's no call. There's no nothing. And you're wondering with those kinds of moments, yeah, this is chippy. It's A, it's a rivalry. B, it's chippy. C, Orlando's wanting to probably take as much as many pounds of flesh as humanly possible on their way out the door if they can't go- get gold. So they'll try to goad you into something. And uh, yeah, it was a bit of a rough day for CCH in the middle. Yeah, I mean, look, Shonde Silva looked like he almost got fish hooked. Uh, while he, yeah, he got a horse collar. He absolutely got a yeah. horse collar. And, uh, and somehow he comes out of that whole situation with a yellow card, um, along with uh, the gentleman who threw him down. Yakamakis was getting hounded the entire game. Um, uh, largely no calls there, which, which eventually led to extreme frustration from him. I'm surprised he didn't get one for dissent as well. Um, look, we, we talked about it coming into the season when you're going to have these replacement officials. Um, the, the hope is we're not discussing them at any point in the game, that we're not discussing them as a factor uh, on the backside of the game. But that, that simply wasn't the case yesterday. I thought in the first two matches, it largely – uh, the officiating was okay. I thought things did get a, a little bit away uh, yesterday, and and luckily it did cool down a little bit the, the last 20 or 30 minutes of that match because we were headed for something. I mean, is you start to chalk up like Mexico beating the hell out of Kobe Jones all those years ago. <laughs> I, I mean, I was waiting for Yakamakis to start getting clipped every time he touched the ball, uh, but luckily it did calm down a little bit. But it, it, it did start to stress a little bit. 
um, how much you don't want to continue too much further with these replacement officials because uh, we weren't the only game. that they, they, There were a lot of red cards thrown out across the MLS this weekend. Jarek, go for it. Yeah, there were. Um, and this, I think this is my part of th- my thing that I'm going to keep harping on is the conversation with the replacement officials is, yeah, uh, you want it to be better. Um, I've also watched pro officials yeah. completely flip a, a – a playoff seating because they didn't know how to call the game correctly or they made blatant mistakes. So, I mean, as long as, as long as we're going to be fair when they get back in and hold them to the same standards and not, you know, put everybody on a pedestal all whole damn time, just get them back in, find some stability. Cause yeah, man, that was you, to your point. It controlling the game is so difficult for a lot of these officials and like how do you control it do you control the cards do you control it with talking how do you assert your authority without like going to a card too early and then you're kind of stuck in a situation where you're gonna have to keep throwing cards and you box yourself into a corner there is an art form to it i think and uh, the fact that he didn't send anybody off was pretty impressive i thought yeah no i absolutely and look like officials are always going to be complained about whether they're the best in the business oh, yeah. or i, I mean <laughs> Like we've seen, yeah, I mean, you you miss one call and and that's all we talk about for for the rest of the night. So whether they're the best of the best or or, or bums off the street, uh, we're here to complain about them as fans if it impacts our team. And so I do agree with you from that aspect, Jared. I I think we we would probably uh, hold anyone to the same standard. But uh, yeah, I I mean, look, ultimately it didn't impact the game in in the way that maybe you're fearful of, right? I I mean, because if you do pick up that second yellow, it it changes things around. And and so ultimately it was okay. Uh, no one got hurt. Uh, let's start there, right? Like no one gets hurt, uh, at least from what we saw and, uh, no one's going to be suspended with red card or anything like that. So Mm -hmm. ultimately it was okay. But in the moment you, you just want your guys to, to, essentially get the calls you feel they deserve and we weren't necessarily getting that yesterday and and then obviously there were a couple of scuffles that took it up a notch as well but it, at the end of the day um you come out with the the win you, you come out relatively healthy and we move forward and to and, your point yeah. ben it's 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 one of those where we talked you and i talked about it at halftime of you wanted more than that one goal lead because you didn't want to be in that situation yeah. where it's the 84th minute and Orlando hits some wayward shot that deflects off Steon Gregerson's foot and then like rolls into the back of the net. And you feel like you're walking out of there with one point that you just, des- when you deserved more, you just didn't want to leave it in the hands of chaos, not even leave it in the hands of the official, but leave it in the hands of just raw unfiltered chaos. Yeah. I, I mean, it's like, it's like in crime movies or whatever, you always got to stay two steps ahead. Uh, however you want that to look. It, it's just like anyone who's played soccer for like any decent length of time knows that like there are fluky goals that happen every game. Um, and, and it's just so easy for small mistakes to turn into big penalties on the other side. And, and so you did have to find that second goal and you had the double save there. And that's, you thought for a moment yeah. you, you could, find that separation between the two teams in that instant. Uh, obviously, it took a, a little while into the second half. Once you got to 2 nothing, you felt pretty comfortable because even if you did get that screwy nonsense that somehow turns into a break or a deflective shot or, or, or God forbid, I, I mean, they almost hit a cross into the side netting. I, I mean, that happens too. Like, just shoot the ball, man. You might you might miss hit it upper 90, right? So, um yeah, getting getting that separation of two goals, I thought was really important to to calm things down as well uh, in the back because they there were some moments where they were playing a little bit tight uh, in the back, a couple of mistakes that that you didn't see the week before, um, giving the ball away in the back, stuff like that. Uh, but again, ultimately didn't cost you. Uh, but there were a couple of scary moments there, especially uh, made even more fearful if if it's only one goal lead. Uh, Abe Gordon, uh, at Abe Gordon on the 200 Indy Character app from a 92.9 The Game, the pre- and the post-game show for Atlanta United, hanging out with us here on a Reaction Monday. Speaking of reactions, Matty Cruz has crashed at a party. So, Matty, what's on your mind? Hello. I thought I'd crash um, because I have a question for Abe. It's about um, the next game against Toronto. It's on the road. But now you have a lot of players who are going to be called up for national team duty. Six, as John is, if you can't see on the Pointing up six. 
And a lot of them are our starters. So how do you anticipate, you know, we finally have this momentum going forward. Now it's going to kind of be shifted a little bit against Toronto. How do you expect the team to make the adjustment? Well, look, we're, we're going to be open and fair about what we expect in, in Toronto. And it's unfortunate that the momentum is, is probably going to stop in this manner. I go into this game just searching for one point. Uh, I'm not even going to confuse the idea that, that we're going to go up there and take home three. With that said, I mean, look, you score a ninth minute goal or, or a fourth minute goal. Um, you know, someone scored in the third minute this week. I, I mean, you get an early opener and, and who knows what can happen. I, I think you're going to get a little bit screwy with the formations. Um, I, I don't know if you're going to go to four in the back. You might switch to five. Uh, you might have a lone, a lone man up top, whether that's Firmino or TRA. Um, for me, no, obviously coming off 45 minutes, uh, with the twos, I know Jarrett could probably speak a little bit stronger on what he was doing out there, but, uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, but ultimately you knew that these times were coming. This is why you brought in, uh, a Dax McCarty to help settle and maybe play a more defensive style if need be in certain moments, but it's going to be incredibly difficult to play with. I mean, so Almada's out, right? He's potentially, yep. arguably, the second best player in the entire league behind Lionel Messi. Um, you, you're going to be without Yakamakis, who is arguably, potentially, the league's best goal scorer. Um, and, and then you mix in a couple of other pieces throughout the midfield that you're going to be without. And, and so it's going to be very difficult, and, and we're not going to go crazy and say, look, this team is built for this. They're going to go on the road. I mean, Toronto's a solid squad. They're going to have a lot more of their starters ready to roll than than we are, and and um, I'm not feeling great about it. Like, I'm really not feeling great uh, about losing that much. I mean, half of your starting lineup, uh, or, or close to half. I know Abram's not necessarily in your starting lineup. He'll be with Peru, but it's going to be a tough go. Uh, I, I think this is a more defensive side uh, when they head to Toronto. But uh, again, and you can miss hit it upper 90, a deflected goal. Take your chances, see what happens. And if you're in a position to then, you know, look, I, I know everyone doesn't want to hear it, but like if you got to park the bus because you scored in the 18th minute, then park the bus um, and, and do what you can do to hold on for three points or, 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 or if it settles for one then do it. It's probably not going to be the best stylistically Atlanta United will be all season, uh, but you got to do what you got to do to get points. And so I'm going to expect them to go out there with a plan, whatever that is, and, and fight for however many they can get home. All right. So, Jarrett, uh, check my math here. So it's Gigi, Tiago, Luisa Brom, Caleb Wiley with the U-22s. Um, Sleesh. Sleesh and Jay Fortune. Those are your six. So those are the yes. those are the six that you're missing. And uh, Tom Russo wanted to know what players were going to be out for uh, the uh, the John Herdman herd, and it's Davy Flores and team captain Jonathan Osorio. So it's six two when it comes to those yeah. who are going to be there. And not. yeah, they will be missing the River Bear, which is it's fine. They, you'll you'll benefit from that. Um, <laughs> Uh, and mostly because Osorio is uh, not a spring chicken anymore. It, no. He can still he he can still have a heavy heavy impact on the game itself. So we'll see um, we'll see how they're able to do that. That but yeah, that, that's that's about it. So now you're trying to figure out you know how you want to piece this together. To to Abe's point, uh, I wasn't actually <laughs> you picked the one time I wasn't at a twos game, so uh, I was not there this weekend. <laughs> right, like those these two were the mm. other people were, but yeah, Nick Firmino feels like the Hey, I need someone to play the ten, and it's going to be interesting because Firmino ain't the same kind of guy that Thiago Almada is. is going to look different. Yeah, I think it, at the times like more goal dangerous and less like dribbling out of trouble, hitting wild passes kind of thing. It's just going to be different, but you know, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I, we're yeah. all going to be trying to replicate Gigi's forty yard <laughs> outside of the foot, oh. you know, banana peel pass. Oh, that was filthy. I'm sorry. Uh, a one other guy that I wanted to to talk to you about before we get out of here and before you actually go and have a life on a Monday, uh, the night that Sabalob Janidze had, 
And Saba was really on one on both sides of the ball. Obviously, the benefactor of the pass that we're going to be listening to the highlights coming up here in just a little bit. Benefactor there, causing problems on the right-hand side. Then he and Shande decide that they wanted to swap places. And so Saba turned into a problem on the left. And then he was also, and Gonzalo Pineda mentioned it post-match, about how uh, Saba's becoming more comfortable defensively with what his uh, with his uh, intentions and expectations are supposed to be. Saba had a sound night both sides of the ball last night. Yeah, it's been really interesting to see how he's developed uh, this season with some of the changes behind him. Um, but he, he is becoming a real threat. There's no doubt about that. And it's going to be interesting to see. You know, I, I feel like this is the third week we've had a different guy. I didn't look at the actual stats, but I feel like it's a different... Uh, a different guy that's picked up the most mileage uh, all three games. And, and, and Saba's, it looks from what he's doing, he may be picking up a, a couple of those marks uh, at some points throughout the season. So, you know, we saw a lot of guys. Uh, I thought it was really interesting to see how many guys from the attack were getting invested in the defense. I know we saw Almada deep in the box uh, a couple of times and, and Saba dropping in. We even saw Yakamakis well into our own defensive half uh, throughout as well. And so it, it's been interesting. But look, it, the thing about Saba is you, you're you focusing so much on Yakamakis and Almada, you almost forget how dangerous this guy is. And, and this is a guy that's not scared to take on defenders. He will dribble by you. He will dribble around you. Uh, and he quietly has a pretty good shot on net. Uh, I, I mean, this it should have been much more difficult for him to find net on the strike that he had. And it was just so easy, so calm, so simple. It didn't have to ring off the inner post. It barely even hit side netting and the keeper was nowhere near it from an angle that he should have been relatively protected against without a, a much better hit. Uh, and it's just one of those things that you're, you're just so darn focused on Yakamakis. And if this is going to help out Shonda Silva throughout the season too, you're so focused up the middle that it, when the attack comes from the outside, you're not as well prepared. And this is a team that does attack from the outside a lot more than you would probably think just based on personnel. I know we all see it, but just based on personnel and, and where things are coming from, they're on the wings, they're on the outside uh, uh, quite a bit. And, and Saba is certainly, um, he was a terror last night. I, I mean, look, we had to give our man of the match to Yakamakis based on that hit uh, for the second goal. And obviously the assist, which is just stellar, plays its role too. But I mean, there, there's some real serious talks about uh, what Saba did because a lot of it did go probably unnoticed stat wise. Uh, but he, he was a man on a mission yesterday. He was a big reason why Atlanta United was com coming away to nothing. All right. Hit the promo for me. What's going on with you and Garrett and everybody there at 92.9 the game. Unfortunately, it's a road game, so we're back in studio against Ooh. Toronto FC. I know they won't fly us up yet. We're in, we're in discussions to see. <laughs> I actually, unfortunately, the mail has lost my passport, so I wouldn't be able to go oh. right now. Anyways, I got to reapply for get for, you to for, get you to Buffalo, and then you can do it from yeah, the, yeah from the well, Peace Bridge. I, I got a telescope that we can can check out BMO Field on, but uh, yeah, find us an hour before kickoff, an hour after kickoff as well, pregame and postgame for Atlanta United. Uh, just a reminder that this weekend's game is going to be on Star 94, um, so make sure you note that down. We'll be reminding you on Twitter and, and throughout the week, but uh, Star 94 for the Atlanta and Toronto match this weekend. Looking forward to it. Thanks, as always, my friend, for coming on for, on a Reaction Monday to give your your thoughts after Atlanta United matches, win, lose, draw, whatever. Thanks for hanging out with us. At oh, hey, Jared, hey, hey, please yeah. go look up. Please go look up uh, the new Tasmanian uh, uh, Australian rules football teams logo. Okay. All right. The, the AFL the Tasmania has the Tasmanian Devils have a new AFL team. No. The logo is outstanding. At, at one hand, it's outstanding. On the other hand, it looks like one of the generated logos from like Madden 04. Okay. This looks like an NFL Europe. Yeah, it's beautiful. Wow. <laughs> NFL Europe's the vibe I'm getting. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. So the Tasmanian. Okay. All right. I get it. All right. So it's the island. And oh, I like. Okay. Yeah. We might have to. Uh, yeah. We might have to dive in there. 
Yeah, we, we might have to Some actually. Sonic the Hedgehog vibes going on. Yeah. Look, man, Gabe's Gabe is my go-to for or, or, Abe is my go-to for this. Sorry. You blended, um, you Abe, is, go, Abe is my together. go-to for this. Whenever we get into like degeneracy of different leagues, if you want true, of the I, I was I was talking about this to Jason Longshore. I I discovered the Kings League uh, this weekend. Do, does anyone here know what the Kings League is? No. So it was started by PK in Barcelona, but there's an America's version that I stumbled upon on Twitch, mm-hmm. and it is a wild rule set. Uh, it's kind of like like fan controlled football a little bit from that perspective. Yeah. It starts out like one v one for a minute, and then two v two, and then you play a game, and then the 18th minute you roll a dice. That's a wild card for how the last two minutes of the half will be played. I, I don't know. I stumbled onto that on Twitch over the weekend. So if you want degenerate soccer. Uh, decent quality of play. I, I would suggest finding the Kings League Americas. Well, and apparently the original Kings League, it, a, after the conclusion of the 2023 winter split, you had a referee quit because he posted a statement which he accused the league's organizers of trying to influence referees' decisions. And during a live stream, he presented it as evidence for the allegations, a clip from a match in which he apparently already knew which secret weapon a team had before it was shown to him. Secret but- weapons, man. It's, it's literally, literally part of their their game plans. Oh yeah, yeah. Secret weapons. Uh, yeah, that's the that is the uh, Spanish version. The chairpersons, the chairpersons are like Iker Casillas, Sergio Aguero. I mean, it's, it, this is this is out of control, man. All right, it, so. it's, it's a good old boys club, but it was it was entertaining. It was, it was a nice, nice little thing to uh, have a couple sips to and watch on a Saturday evening. <laughs> <laughs> so well, now that we've added this to our corruption, thanks for hanging out, my friend. Crash anytime. You got it. Have a great uh, rest of the Monday, Cal. All yeah. right, that, that's uh, that's Abe. So uh, Abe and Garrett, you know, when Garrett can break away from actually working, uh, he'll come and crash a party as well. But it's always great to have Abe come in on the Tom Coughlin, uh, the Tom Coughlin approach. He always drops in five minutes early, so for him that's on time, and so we get to hang out with him for about twenty minutes. Uh, and apparently, okay. So Modiflo says it's degenerate soccer with Twitch rules. Uh, player walked out, took PKs, and then left. So you you had that kind of stuff going on. Yeah, Bam uh, doing the the public service, showing us where the logo is, and I actually looked it up. Uh, yeah, the Tasmanian Devils makes sense considering what they've been able to do there in Hobart. Sidebar uh, with their. Uh, with the touring that the AFL does to try to make sure that folks can come and hang out and watch in other markets and stuff. Um, but yeah, I do see the Sonic the Hedgehog kind of look here and, and having a large letter T in the middle of the Tasmanian uh, country that was uh, basically plastered right on the, the center of the jersey. So uh, it, it was inevitable that they were trying to expand to Tasmania. Oh, he's always a team owner. Team owner went out and uh, took a took a shot. Okay, so thank you for letting me know who Ebay Gomez is. Uh, Abby wants to know about yesterday, and, and for those of you that were in the building, our seventeen spotlight was we had uh, we we had folks reenact their favorite goal from the Yakamakis hat trick from the previous match, and so you know uh, the Hoff, God bless him. You know, we wanted to do it as accurately as possible, you know, try to have a net. And I was thinking it was going to be one of those nets that, you know, is like maybe the two foot tall net that you have to make sure that you pass the ball on the ground to put the ball in the net or something, you know, the two foot wide by two foot wide or the three by two. No, the folks at the training ground gave him a quick goal. So that meant it was like eight feet wide and six feet high. So we had to construct the thing. We literally had like half a dozen folks from the production team inside Mercedes Benz coming out there to help us assemble the thing. And we had folks reenact the, their favorite goals, whether it was the PK, the header, or the, the chest settle and trying to hit it with the outside of the boot. Yours truly was in net. And, and Abby wants to know if there's any injury from my quick moving out of the way yesterday at the tailgate. The answer is no, because I moved quickly and got out of the way. So I actually got out of there unscathed. I'm, I'm hoping more than anything else that the net that we used got out of it uh, unscathed. And yeah, and, and uh, Tom, it was notified. I did notify the Hoff about the whole tucking into the jersey bit because uh, uh, he, uh, he was quite the, uh, the tucked in sort. 
you know, he, he wanted to tuck in his he wanted to tuck in his jersey in, instead of yours truly, who let it hang and, and had it, you know, on not tucked in. Just so. um, Armas is the only one that can pull that off right now. Yeah, I think so. Because because uh, Javier Armas on a good day might be 130 pounds. Like, he, um, he, is there a video of this? I don't know if they post them. Uh, you know, knowing the Hoff, he probably could find it uh, and post it someplace. But no, it was inside the building yesterday, and you know we can we can try and chase after said video. But no, I did a, I did a, a, an incredible impression of the New England Revolution keeper from uh, last week to to make sure that the segment was historically accurate, and, and the Hoff can back me up because Joe actually saw me looking at the goals to see what direction the New England keeper would dive to try and either save the PK and miss or try to defend the goal on the other two goals. I was trying to be as historically accurate as possible to make sure that I was diving the proper direction when the shots came toward the net. As you should. I mean, I would expect nothing less. You have to be historically accurate if yeah. you're going to do, you know. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. This if is it, journalistic it, integrity we're talking about. Exactly. Like, I, yeah. I mean, I mean, come on now. You can't just sit there and do a reenactment and not be historically accurate. It, it, it's, you know, the journalistic integrity that's attached. Uh, Modiflo is also trying to track down uh, early nicknames for, for the supporters for Javier Armas. Is it, is it Armas Army? Is it uh, Armas de Fuego? The, you know, look, uh, they're all good. I'm digging it. We might act, and we, at this point, we might have to actually add to our stacks uh, with the, the SDH gear. I need him to win a game so that we can get a Armas didn't blow it counter. There, there you go. Yes. There you go. And uh, Javi has actually more hair than Chris Armas does. Uh, and uh, Modiflo letting us know Armas de Fuego has a double meaning. Thank you. Because I would have to look both of them up. Uh, time to, to say hi to everybody. And uh, Bart Keeler joining us at the top of the hour. We'll see if Drew has actually survived the weekend after what a lot of folks are saying was the greatest FA Cup match ever in the history of the tournament. We'll, we'll see if Drew actually has recovered. And I was going to ask if, if anyone has heard from Drew. That's the other question. Yeah, we, uh, I mean, Drew did DM me after the match was over. And for those that may not uh, know that Drew lives and dies by his Manchester United, the 3D that we release on Fridays is the evidence of said uh, allegiance. Down 3-2 after the first 15 minutes, of the added 30 after being tied after 90. You're down 3-2 after 105. Rashford scores to make it 3-3. And then Diallo scores in added time, extra time, stoppage time to win 4-3. And Manchester United advances to the semis. Liverpool will not win the quad. And uh, Jurgen Klopp stormed out of a post-match uh, press uh, opportunity with, I believe it was a Scandinavian outlet because... They asked a question, and he was not a fan of it. And so he stormed out, and we'll pr try and have the uh, the audio of that for you tomorrow. So uh, we'll see if Drew has, in fact, we'll see if he has, in fact, recovered. Uh, let's see. Morning, Dell. Morning, Alex. Morning, Bam. And, of course, Bam doing the Lord's work. Uh, Acosta for goal of the year. Yeah, we kind of got to get into that. Six red cards in 12 matches on Saturday. We'll get into that. Tafka is back. Everyone missed you, Tafka. Morning pars, morning four card, and four card only for your observation. For those of you that were in the match uh, in, inside Mercedes Benz and got to see prescription for victory, yes, we posted as many goals as possible only for your observation, 17. We were thinking about you. Uh, so let's see. Uh, Kefsi is in, Shooter is in, and Shooter, uh, under normal circumstances, it wouldn't be a Monday if Shooter wasn't hot. So, Shooter, Caleb Porter sucks. And then uh, the rest of the Twitch pitch uh, gets to see just how mad Shooter is about Caleb Porter, who actually took responsibility for the team losing their first four matches in Major League Soccer. And Shooter also took a shot at Richie Williams. Uh, Low-hanging fruit. Uh, let's see. Tom, it was great to see everybody out in, this, uh, in the parking lot, and we'll get into comments a little later. So, Will is in this morning. Will is actually requesting, Jarrett, that we bring Spencer in on a live show of either SDH or SOT. That's not safe. We'll I'm pretty it. sure that violates multiple parts of the, Gen the Geneva Convention. Mm. All the more reason to have Spencer on. So uh, uh, there you go. Uh, let's see. Coco is in this morning. 
Uh, Coco, we mentioned the negotiations. Uh, they're still negotiating. Apparently, the increase was up to 20% to get them back uh, working, and they possibly, probably, uh, allegedly might have said no. Uh, Emilio's in this morning. Coco's in. Uh, let's see. Tom and Abby. Abby wondering about uh, my own physical well-being, as she always does. And uh, so let's see. I think And Ropes is in this morning watching on YouTube. And I uh, think we are officially caught up with stuff. Yes, and Tom is sitting there think- thanking as the resident Evertonian fan. Thank you to Manchester United. So, yes, away to Coventry City next. So, yeah, and Spencer and uh, Will lets us know that Spencer does, in fact, live in Atlanta. Um, to get him on the show would be a major coup. It really would. But it would be it would be fun to do that. All right. Uh, we'll get into stats and numbers and everything and get you ready for uh, Bart Keeler coming in top of the hour. We'll go through some refing down here. We'll go through the national team. Anything else on Bart's mind? Refing down here. We got to talk about what happened with West Ham, where you had the longest VAR in the history of VAR. I swear to God, nine thousand minutes to review something on the north end of ninety plus. So we got to get into that. We'll get into the national team. Anything else on Bart's mind? And then Drew again at ten thirty. So, uh, all right. So we have goals and we have things to talk about. So the way that things go, we're going to roll right into the highlights and let you know once again, this was the the banana ball that that occurred, and it was just incredibly filthy. So this goal made it 1-0 early on, and this is what Atlanta United needed so they weren't having to fight uphill the entire time and go up against a team that would have been just more than happy to pack it in and be there just so they wouldn't get fined. Here's your first goal of the match. Courtesy of our friends at 92.9, the game in Major League Soccer. Mike and Jason on the call. Throw by Wiley that deflects to Yakimakis. will swing across to Saba with Gillespie off his line. Saba dribble, dribble, dribble to the edge of the six. Tap angle, shot, score! Listen, all you all, it's a sabotage! <laughs> and Atlanta United strikes early to take the 1 0 lead. Oh, thank God. <laughs> See, that happened. I'm glad that Mike got to, was able to drop that one in. That was a fun one. Glad, and Jarrett, when we were talking about the highlights at the half and that, came, that, that highlight came across in the highlight package, all I could do was laugh because you get a moment like this and Gigi is over on the far left up against the touchline. He muscles a defender off, basically shoves him, and it's like, get out of here with you and your ish and then has an opening and decides, how am I going to get the ball to Saba? What I'm going to do is I'm going to hit it with the outside of my right boot, and it's going to it's going to be one of the, the nastiest uh, power fades you've ever seen. And what I wanted to, you know, I, we got to ask Abe about Saba, but Saba really was on one last night. Yeah, he was. Um, you need, you have at this point, you have two, very dynamic wingers who can at times run hot and cold and that's okay Mm -hmm. um because you have a you have an incredibly deep winger room so if something's not working you can go to different guys with different skill sets um one of the cruelest things that this team does in fact often is throwing on edwin mosqueda in the 75th minute (laughs) against tired defenses because guys like there's a sequence late in that game where edwin runs across the field chasing the ball um and because i i I think I described it. He's like, he, he moves like a toddler who just got over the flu yes. in that it's, it's a nonstop, very fast motion. But there's a sequence where he chases the ball across the field and just harries like three different Orlando players who can't put in crosses because he won't leave them alone. Nope. And you, you love having that. But with the guys who start, you know, Shande is very dynamic and so is Saba for different reasons. They're different kinds of guys, but they're going to have games where they run hot and cold. That's okay because you have the depth to go to different hands. But when they're hot, you know, and, and I mean, even for instance, the New England game, I thought Atlanta went to Saba early in that game. Yeah, he was very problematic for New England, and then they kind of went away from him in the first half, and I didn't get it. I was a little frustrated that they they went away from him. And you went to him today on that counter because Gigi hits one of the. Like, the fact that it wasn't pass of the week is 
<laughs> and I get there's a couple of Travalo balls this week for, for assists. <laughs> yes. The fact that that wasn't you, you, the fact if it was not your pass of the week, I don't I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't know how to deal with that help. conversation because it's a forty yard ball mm-hmm. that is just fading around the defender who's never gonna get to it. No. Saba, who's faster than I think <coughs> people give him yeah, credit for. I think so. And you know, he's able to get it, able to kind of kind of do a little bit of a hesitation on the defender and then go watch, go back and watch that and watch Pedro Galese. Um because Galese gets basically locked into place. And as Saba hits that ball, Gillespie's dropping to his knees. And I couldn't tell at first what happened. I wasn't sure 100% if it was a matter of, you know, if it was a matter of Saba, like, juked him out, or if it was a matter of Gillespie lost his balance, or a little bit of both, because he kind of, like, Saba just held his nerve, man. Well, and why is Gillespie going so hard to the near post? Gillespie? Oh, yeah, why? You gotta you gotta guard that near post. I mean, you don't want to literally sit on it, but you have to, especially at the angle he was coming down. The defenders trying to take away that far post and trying to take away anything going the other way and force him to that near post, which is the right thing because then your goalkeeper has a near post to defend. We saw Brad make a save in the first half at his near post in a similar situation. It's a further distance, but you had I forget who it was, um, might have been uh, Ladero put a shot in like snap, a slap shot in to that bottom near post and Brad had to get out and make it. If, if, if you're defending, you can push them towards that near post and cut down the angle. But then Saba okidokes his defender <laughs> and Galese at that point is just kind of stuck. And then he commits down, drops to his knees. He's not going to be able to get to anything to the far post, but it's tough, man. It's so much easier said than done. When we like think about a def- when we think about an attacker holding his nerve until the very last possible second, Joseph was so good at this. If you go back and look at some of the the plays where Joseph would round the keeper, or he would take he would round the keeper, he would take that extra touch and didn't rush it. Everything slowed down for him. Man, it slowed down for Saba in that moment. It's so beautiful and it, it, give Saba his flowers because oh, he worked his ass off. He led the lead, He led the team in sprints against New England. He's had a number of games where he just works works and works and there's no real payoff for it like no there, there's no goal or assist in it but he's still doing thankless work in this instance he did thankless work and he got a goal for it and more power to him breaking news out of the premier league coming up in just a little bit maddie what's on your mind also i mean saba had a brilliant performance but i mean yakamakis came in there and just showed everyone you know hey i can score goals but i also can deliver beauties mm. I, oh my goodness! I watched that goal like I think five times yesterday because of how good it was. Oh, oh my god! Absolutely so filthy. Uh, Saba's numbers, according to our friends at SofaScore, uh, wrapped the day with a seven point nine, eighty-five minutes with a goal, thirty-eight touches, seventeen to twenty from passing, four key passes for Saba yesterday. One for two on his crosses, hit his only long ball, one shot on target, two for four on the dribble was four of eight on his duels, three of seven on the ground, got his only uh, aerial duel, one, uh, one pick and a tackle. So Saba had a very busy day. So, of course, yes, Jared. Uh, after this, uh, Tom, we, we do, I just want to let Tom know, we will talk about the Chicago goal, I promise. Uh, we'll absolutely. get there. Yeah, we will. Uh, all right, so goal number two on the board. Uh, yeah, we're just going to go ahead and play it. Once again, courtesy of our friends at 92.9 The Game in Major League Soccer. Some dude named Yakamaki scored and uh, drove Jake Ziven crazy, rightfully so. But uh, here's how that one laid out. Ball to the far touchline, Moyamba. Poked ahead towards Sada. He'll accept it now in front of the right halfway line. And bounce it ahead now to Brooks Lennon, who dribbles into the box right side. Cuts it back. Lennon with the man falling down to Almada. Shot! Off the crossbar and in! Boom, Yakamakis! Atlanta United explodes for a critical second goal. It's 2-0. He ain't kidding. It was critical. You needed that second goal like nobody's business, Jared. You did, like we talked about with Abe. Huh? And he and I talked about it at halftime in the press boxes. <clears throat> when you had a one-goal lead, it's fine. 
but you wanted more, especially yeah. when Pedro Galese made uh, really three outstanding saves. You know, oh. he makes the one off Derek Williams where he tips it over the crossbar. It may or may not have gotten. He may or may it may or may not have gone in. Yeah, but it's the 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 on the double save he makes off of um on the double save he makes off of Williams and then Gigi. Mm-hmm. Both of those are just comically good saves and it keeps Orlando in the game um so you you had to put the game away you didn't want to keep it at one nil and great you got the clean sheet but you don't necessarily want to live that way Gonzalo Pineda doesn't want to live that way he is waxed repeatedly about you know if you have a one goal lead go make it a two goal lead if you have a two goal lead go make it a three goal lead and so on and so forth yeah go create as much distance as you can between yourself and your opponent don't don't try and hold that one goal lead if you can help it try and make it bigger try and create that gap but it's, it's another situation though where brooks lennon he, put, he puts his man on his ass a great job from brooks <laughs> yeah but again he holds his nerve like he looks up there's nothing there he doesn't freak out and just pump it into the mixer he waits he waits checks his watch and he waits again maybe <laughs> updates linkedin and waits again yeah. and then gg makes that kind of peel back run and he puts it a little one-time ball right at gg's feet and it's perfect pace perfect location he's just able to step into it like a kickball mm-hmm. and there you go i mean the rest of his history man but yeah, you still it's it's a great job from lennon of, of getting down that right hand side and he connected well with saba a lot of the time and it was in atlanta was kind of in a weird shape coming into that situation because you started making subs, um, you're starting to make changes. There was a there was a point in the game which I thought was funny as hell, where um, where you had actually put for a minute William Boss shifted to right back. Yep. And then you had Slish and uh, Jay Fortune in the middle, and then you had Caleb Wiley pushing hard in, and then Brooks had pushed up the field. Um, and Caleb Wiley had pushed hard from left back into the middle to support the buildup, kind of like we're used to seeing Brooks do. Yep. There's a couple sequences in there where, like, you go back and look at, like, the, if you have, like, an all-22 view, there's one sequence, and then they put Almada on the, out on the left wing where, like, Atlanta was charging down the right-hand side. The Orlando defenders looked around like, what the – who the hell do we – who do we mark? Because it was just kind of this empty cup look that Atlanta gave, and they didn't know who to mark, and then you started getting free runners in. Nothing happened in that instance, but you you, you really kind of screwed with their heads for a bit. But, man, the combination on the right was really good, and it's it's fantastic from Brooks not to just ping it in there and hope for the best. He just waits and waits mm-hmm. and waits, mm-hmm. and then you get magic. Yes, you do. Uh, we'll go ahead and go here because uh, Bart Keeler coming up just around the corner. And we'll talk national team. We'll talk refing down here. We'll talk uh, whatever else is on Bart's mind this morning. But we got to get into this in the Premier League. According to Will Unwin at the Guardian, looks like Nottingham Forest is going to get docked four points for breaching Premier League profit and sustainability rules, dropping them into the relegation zone one point from safety announcement from the Premier League expected today, forced likely to appeal. They admitted the breach, but their defense was based around extenuating circumstances in relation to the sale of Brennan Johnson. The club received a 30 million pound offer from Brentford early last summer, but Johnson was unwilling to move. Forrest felt they could get more money for their star asset if they waited beyond the 30 June PSR deadline. Sold for 47 and a half to Spurs in September, but the independent panel did not accept this defense with all money earned from selling Johnson, an academy product going down as profit. Then uh, the club argued their approach was designed to make them more sustainable. Remember, uh, Premier League clubs are only supposed to lose a total of 105 million over a three year period. Forrest's permitted losses were limited to 61 because they spent two years of that period in the championship. This was another part of their defense with the club claiming they were hamstrung after being promoted because investment in the squad is vital to challenge at a higher level against more established teams. Since promotion, by the way, Nottingham Forest have signed 42 players at a cost of about a quarter of a billion dollars, helping them retain their Premier League status last season. So an announcement supposed to come later today. 
But Will Unwin at the Guardian reporting that Nottingham Forest is going to get docked four points that will put them in the relegation zone, one point below Luton, who drew Forest on the weekend, and that might turn into a big-ass point down the road. Right. right now, Luton one point above them out of the relegation and bam, uh, no, Man City does not lose points. Uh, in fact, Man City might gain points. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I don't make the rules. That's just uh, it's just how it be sometimes. But yes, you know, I don't make I don't I don't make the EPL rules. And um, if if you ever feel like Eric Bischoff <laughs> might be running EPL, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. Oh, oh boy. Uh, to Hutch's point, <clears throat> as he hits the uh, he hits the wet blanket button, and that's fine. Let's talk about it because. Um, I think it is important to talk about the last two wins you had for Atlanta because they were vital. Not yeah. necessarily just because you lost the first game to Columbus, best team in the league. Go look at what Columbus did to Red Bulls this year. They basically put Red Bull or last this week. They basically put Red Bulls in a Steiner recliner for ninety minutes. Mm. Um, and they were like pinging the ball around Red Bulls. It was it, 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 Columbus, is the best team in the league. Like, yeah. <laughs> you don't need a hot take here. You don't. You don't need to rationalize it. You don't need to get cute with it just the best team in the league. It's fine. Um, you had two games against teams that were playing in CONCACAF Champions Cup. Yep. They were coming in more tired than you. Yep. You had to win them, mm-hmm. and you did. The first one, very convincing fashion. second one, less convincing, but kind of a grit and sandpaper game. And it's good that you can win a game where you're not playing your ideal game. Yep. You, you had to play differently in that game, and you got it done. So, but there were games you had to win because you have a very favorable situation on your hands where two teams are coming into your house and they're tired. And now you have to go play in Toronto, missing a slew of people. Yeah, she was going to be on the other foot here. So you have to go on the road. You're going to be short a lot of guys, a number of key guys. But yeah, man, you, the, yeah, you had to beat these teams. And New England, I don't know what New England will be. Caleb Porter might be broken. We don't know. <laughs> Caleb I think Porter might get broken. I think Orlando will be fine down the road. Yeah. Um, they'll, they'll figure something out. Mm-hmm. And I think you'll be able to look back and feel really good about that win, even though it's at home. But you were at home. Yeah. Team's coming in tired. And uh, we, I was talking about the, with, with Mike Conti before the game of – because he was saying, he said that flight to Monterey that Orlando had oh. to take. So that flight to Monterey is a lot longer – and yeah. rougher than you think it is. It's at least four hours. It's like going to Salt Lake City. It's 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 it is not to be. Uh, this is not a puddle jump to Orlando or to Charlotte. Yeah, like that's a long flight. It is, say. and there's no guarantee when you get there that you're just going to be able to turn around and come right back. You might be there for a day or two. Correct. Uh, more time traveling, maybe less time. You know, read. Uh, you know, doing regeneration in your home, sleeping in your own bed, that kind of yep. thing. Yep. It's it's tough. Um. And yeah, to, to Tom's point, you can only play who's on your schedule. Yeah, and you're going to have some really tough stretches. And you're going to have to deal with them. Yep, no but doubt. This was this was one of those that, for me personally, was you needed to win this game. You need yep. to win both these games because of the situations that you were in. The fact that you won it in a different way was important to me. It shows me that you can be a gritty sob. Yep. That's great. Yep. Uh, hi, Bart. Morning, y'all. What's the mug? Uh, this is my friend Mary's goofy mug. Okay. So I'm, in, well, I'm currently in Nashville, Tennessee. So. Um, oh, okay. So uh, why? Home. Why pray tell? Were you in Nashville? Uh, Casey Musgraves dropped an album on Friday. I got to see her at the Ryman Friday night and met her Ooh. on Saturday at a signing event. So oh. That's why I'm in Nashville. Well, so so how was Casey Musgraves? It was was she? She's great, actually. She was very good. Just che- well, I mean, just checking in the sense of when you when you got the meet and greet, you know, what was it like? She was, she was nice. Uh, actually, she was really nice. She actually talked to us. Granted, we were one of the first like hundred people, so she probably wasn't going to do that for the rest of the day. But um, <laughs> very nice. You could tell she was very tired. She did Good Morning America Friday morning, which, as you know, John, that means you're you're up early to get hair, makeup, and everything else done. Um, so she did that Friday morning in New York City then flew down to Nashville to perform at the Ryman Friday night. Um, and so she, she, she was very pleasant, but very tired on Saturday. 
Well, just glad that uh, that you all had a good meet and greet and uh, yes. had a had a fun weekend. Uh, as always, yes. thanks for coming on with us. At Ten o'clock, uh, of course. Ten o'clock Eastern on uh, on Mondays. Uh, a lot of folks have already, you know, posted their thoughts in, in the repping down here part of the planet, a- and they want to know why Robin Janssen's horse collar tackle was not a red card on Shonday Silva. Um, yeah, it was a yellow yeah. <laughs> because the referee didn't want to give that, which is weird because this was a red card heavy weekend, yeah, uh, in MLS. So, yeah. um, I don't necessarily, I'll, I'll, I don't want to defend the referee too much because I think he uh, did not have a great game in terms of just managing everything. Yeah, CCA um, was, had a rough one, yeah, yeah, but um, I don't think that one was not, the one. I don't think that is red card necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, just, just saying. Um, it was also one of those times where as a referee, you have to understand the situation yeah. uh, that they're in. And he's obviously frustrated because John De Silva has taken the ball, run away from him. Um, that said, I, I'm surprised he didn't get a second yellow card um, in that moment. Yeah. Because the referee pulled out the yellow card. He almost did do a little bit of the blackjack dealer because he pulled out the yellow card immediately and holy cow it was it was a little bit uh crazy in that moment but i think it, i think a yellow card is perfectly fine for what happened for Janssen there um i'm just surprised at the reaction that would have was so just like i don't know why he was so angry um about throwing another human to the ground and getting in trouble for it <laughs> you threw another human into the ground yeah. sir you're not allowed to be upset <laughs> So, and it's also funny because this is something that Orlando does all the time if they have a lead, right? That's true. They have a little bit of Philly in them where they they like to whine, complain, moan, and a B word that I'm not going to say right now to, you know, waste time to do all this stuff. But as soon as the, they're behind and they have to, you know, start trying to make a comeback, holy cow, any inconvenience is like, the, I mean, this is Orlando's DNA. Yeah, is to whine and complain over the slightest inconvenience in the soccer game ever. We know this with this club. Um, they're not mentally strong. They're kind of, you know, they have an inferiority complex. And we know that, that it plays out on the field. Um, and I'm surprised that there weren't other issues um, that were met with cautions, if not more. Yeah. Uh, Jarrett for Bart, go for it. Yeah, let's talk about, um, not, I guess, just this game for now. We can expand it out to the rest of the league. But how tough is it getting thrown into a rivalry game when you are the man in the middle or woman in the middle and yeah. you know, it's going to be chippy. How do you find that line to, to control the game, but not necessarily control yeah. it with cards. So you don't like box yourself in, in the 30th minute where you're like having to throw cards to control it. Well, first off, I would tell any referee that it's okay to use cards in games like this, because if that you have to have just the level in your mind set, does that make sense? You have to have this level, this threshold of, okay, we'll allow some things. We'll talk to some players. But if you do this, that is a yellow card. Because um, usually for me, my standard is a level of a hard foul. You know, we can have a conversation of, well, we need to chill. Once it happens once or twice, then maybe we need a yellow card. Because uh, one of the things we always talk about of, uh, it's not always a yellow card to the player. It's one of those things where we say the player might need a yellow card. The game might need a yellow card. Mm -hmm. And so having those standards set before you go into the game, but also some of the standards of trash talk and extracurriculars, right? How much are you going to allow? Because we know that these two teams don't like each other. Uh, We know that these two clubs have history. Um, So you don't want to police everything, (laughs) but you do need to make sure that you're keeping things cool. Um, and that pressure cooker somewhat in control. When it comes to the the dealing out of the cards, I think uh, there are a lot of times where folks may not necessarily understand what is attached to persistent infringement, where it might be a particular player's first foul, yes. but if it's along the same lines as other similar fouls by teammates, 
then yes. the last guy in the assembly line ends up getting the card. And a lot of folks yes. don't understand that that is because yes. of a long line of issues that led up to a point instead of, well, wait a second, that was his first foul. But that was also the fourth or fifth time that the same foul has occurred. That happened as well this weekend. Well, newsflash, you can get a yellow card for your first foul. <laughs> it's possible. Uh, there are a lot of reasons, and you just described one, John, because, um, well, first off, I would argue that it's, pro it's highly unlikely that a player has started the match. That was their first foul if we're giving persistent infringement to an entire team. Yeah. Because um, you're right. That is one of those persistent infringement kind of qualifications of a player has persistently infringed the laws of the game. A team has done it too much. And specifically, a lot of times what you should see, and MLS needs to work on this, is when a certain opponent player gets fouled a lot. <laughs> yeah. should A, call the fouls, and B, kind of keep track of how many times Tiago Amada has been kicked from behind or that Gigi has been thrown to the ground with a bear hug and caution the uh, opponent for that as well. So that's one of those other persistent infringements. But you're right. Like, you can – and I think this is one of those things that – specifically in MLS, these, you know, replacement referees have to be aware of is um, tactical fouling at the professional level looks a lot different than it does at a collegiate level. Um, you know, you may think of a tactical foul as just, the, oh, well, they're running behind me. Let me grab the jersey. But I think we talked about this last week with um, Kyle Walker. He fouled, had a couple fouls at midfield. Those are the types of professional fouls we're talking about, where he knows that his job here is to make sure the player doesn't get past him. It's not in a super dangerous position necessarily, right? But it's still in a position where he knows that he can't get beat. And so he's either winning the ball or the player's going to the hospital. There's no in between. Um, <laughs> and, and I think that's something that these replacement refs need to kind of understand is those – um, there's also that middle of just like, well, you know, a little kick from behind a couple times. You may think, oh, well, let it play. Those types of things are a professional's way of getting an advantage on the other team in a kind of, you know, a illegal way. <laughs> kind of illegal. I don't want to say illegal, but, you know, it's one of those things where it's just like yeah, those little things add up. So, yeah. yeah. Why? Yes, they do. Uh, Jarrett for Bart, go for it. And as far as we did talk about the rest of the rest of the league, um, it, it was it just a full moon? Did I miss something? All the red cards? I don't, it was just a really I, don't I don't know. Like I, I'm with you, Jared. Because and I watched a lot of the red cards back, and I, I will defend a little bit the, the replacement refs. A lot of these red cards were pretty like apparent. <laughs> they weren't. They weren't exactly like wow. They missed that, and the referees even saw the thing on the field. You know, I think this is a theme we're seeing with the replacement refs and. There's a lot of VAR overturning um, or reversing or whatever um, escalating in the case of this weekend. But I think the referees were even trying to like allow these players to stay on. But when you see like a Keaton Parks where he just stomps on the foot of someone, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think uh, the Red Bulls one where you get two yellow cards for stupid fouls. And honestly, the second foul could have almost been a red card in its own right. You know, those aren't referee issues. Now, I will say, I think you look at that and say, okay, there were six red cards given on Saturday alone. Uh, only one of those was a double yellow card. What was the referee doing throughout the rest of the game to manage the tone, manage the temperature, and manage the, uh, the, the way players were going into tackle? So that is something that I, I think people forget that the pro referees, the PSRA referees who work for pro specifically, they're trained – as professional referees to kind of understand that. Now we, we argue with them a lot and that's fine, but you can see the difference in quality of game management between the two referees because six yellow or six red cards in a day is a lot. All right. So then let's go rapid fire on these reds, Chicago, Montreal, you end up with a red by Raheem Edwards in the 82nd minute of a crazy match that had the, the Kellen Acosta, uh, draw that would have made a PGA golfer jealous uh, to, to wrap things up. Which, by the way, apparently on Twitter shows how terrible the league is because, uh, you know, all goalkeepers should be accurately accounting for Chicago wind because that's <laughs> something that every sports professional has ever had to deal with. Yeah. Well, did, did, did you know 
that this has never happened in another league in the in the entire never. world. Never. No, never has another mm-hmm. league had to deal with it. And certainly not even in a professional sports league in the United States has it has wind ever been a problem with yeah. players catching the ball. Never has Tim Especially Howard not in Chicago. Yeah. Never has Tim Howard while playing in the Prem scored a right. goal because he hit a ball into basically, you know, basically into like a wind temple from Avatar. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, all right, so Raheem Edwards, Montreal, red, yes or no? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so that was the first match of the day, and it had a red. Next match of the day, Miami and D.C., and in that one, Pedro Santos gets a red for D.C. down two goals in the 90th minute, yes or no? I think I think it's – like, I think we're going to find this. I think you can see that all these could be red cards, yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Seattle and Colorado, Josh Atencio gets a red in the 57th minute. Would I you- think so. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I need to go back and watch this fully, like in the game. Yeah. Uh, I just watched the highlights because I want to see what all led up to it. Okay. Because it was a weird one where he got a yellow card and then a red card. It wasn't a double yellow card. Okay. Uh, so I want to see that. Um, I need to watch that fully because that was, a, that was weird. Okay. Uh, Edelman at 90 plus six for Red Bulls against Columbus. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> that was his double yellow card, and both yellow cards were fat over legit. Uh, then the Keaton Parks red, NYC and Toronto, NYC would eventually win, but Keaton Parks red card happened three minutes after the O'Toole goal that gave them the 2 1 lead. I, I struggled with this one because I think I understand why. I, I think the referee probably didn't see a great look of it live because it was a little bit off the ball. Um, a little behind the play, I should say, maybe not off the ball, but he saw it and was like, Oh, I need to address that. And gave him a yellow card, um, came back and get the red card. It, it, it's one of those where like, you can't just stomp on a player's foot and expect to walk away unscathed. You can't stomp on a player's foot and, and expect yeah. not to get out unscathed. Yeah. The first I mean, five matches on the board for major league soccer on Saturday had red cards in them. And I, I mean, I, you know, it could be just the way that the schedule was laid out on the grid on the page, but literally yeah. the first five matches of the day had red cards. I don't think I've ever seen a situation like that where you where you end up with a red. L.A. in the craziness, late night and MLS after yeah. dark. Caceres at 90 plus nine while L.A. is trying to hang on to a point. Yeah. Uh, again, probably like you see why this is a red card. That makes sense. It's it's hard for me to just say, uh, you know, definitively either any of these were not red cards. Um, and I think some of them are very clear red cards, and I understand why they weren't given red cards immediately. Um, they had to go to VAR, because I think a, a couple of them had a VAR review, um, which, again, is one of those things where a, a newer referee in this league, um, slightly inexperienced, is not looking to give red cards all the time, right? Yeah. Um, but one of these things you have to look for is, okay, well, this does rise to the level of serious foul play or violent conduct. Most of these were serious foul play. Yeah. You, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to rock the boat because you're the new kid in school, but sometimes you've got right. to rock the boat because you're the new kid in school. Right. Uh, one other incident before we slide into the national team activity, uh, since we haven't had the chance to talk about the national team roster and then the two subs that have been brought in because of injuries, getting ready for action at the tail end of the week, and then we'll have two other matches to talk about this time next week, or actually one leading Hopefully lifting a trophy. Right, one leading into another. Okay, uh, all right. So the last one that I wanted to get into with VAR down here seemingly was the longest VAR check in the history of VAR checks in all of mankind. And I'm not kidding. I swear to God, I was watching the end of West Ham and Aston Villa and Jared Gillett, the man in the middle, determined after more than five minutes that Tomas Suchek committed a deliberate handball in a a ruling that could have swung the match one way or the other. That was 1-1. You think you score late. You go to a five-minute review. West Ham's winners wiped off the board, and it's just shared result at London Stadium. I gotta be honest. I wasn't sure why this took so long to be like, yeah, it is one of those things where it's not a, you maybe wouldn't call this a handball in live play because it does kind of hit you. I could see letting this go in live play. Does that make sense? Yeah. But what part of the review also is making sure as we know, there's a boundary 
of what is the playable part of the you know body and in the arm right we we kind of look at it as the bottom of the armpit so part of the review was i think making sure you identified that yes it struck part of his arm and then identifying okay was this part of that playable part of the body or part of the arm that we don't allow um but i still don't understand why it took so long to get to because to me it's very clearly a if it's a handball it led to a, a directly led to a goal so we don't have a goal right um that's part of the laws of the game if you have a handball either deliberate or, in, or not um that directly leads to a goal we're not allowing that necessarily um so i think the i don't know why it took so long to determine if it hit the playable part of the body or not um and that was the concern for me is why it took why we were so indecisive on that and this is again john one of those things where you know there's a lot of processes that goes through and, and the check mark boxes you have to go through but um this one was pretty cut and dry of like we're looking for a handball and the fact that it took so long to determine that is i would say that the west ham faithful yeah this was west ham who scored it yeah yeah, yeah. Um, deserve to be a little aggrieved um, that it took so long to take their goal away. But I, I think ultimately it was the right call. Um, I'm just, I agree that it took too long to figure out was this really, you know, was this a, uh, an infringement or not? Yep. And at that point, mm -hmm. maybe you just don't have it. Like maybe yeah. you'd say, okay, the call on the field's good. Okay. But there were a lot, there were like three of those in that game, John. Yeah, there were. So I was like, we, we're all pros at this at this point. What are we looking at? <laughs> yeah. Uh, one one incident, Leon Bailey checks onto his left foot, attempts a cross, ball strikes Emerson's pointing hand. Center ref waves away the protests. In yeah. Number yeah. two, shortly before the half, Mikhail Antonio, he thought that uh, he wheels away. This is how it's phrased by our friends at the Telegraph. Wheeled away to celebrate bundling in Jared Bowen's in-swinging corner. So Mikhail Antonio thought he had a goal on the board with the, it being at 1-1. VAR, though, adjudged he had handled in the process. And then we had the incident, the third incident. Five minutes, 37 seconds was how long it took for that to uh, to eventually get the call correct. But you probably could have looked at it in far less than 5.37 and yes. come up with uh, the correct. Also, for uh, Mikel Antonio's goal, I was shocked that it wasn't given for obstruction because, I mean, that was clear boxing out the goalkeeper and those are the like yes he's within a playable space of the ball but the goalkeeper also like the, at, he didn't have control of the ball by the time he was boxing them out you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. um i was surprised that was allowed to stand even for that but anyway the handball was called so it's all good all right uh concacaf nations league final four coming up josh sergeant luca della torre injured comma out haji wright is in as a part of the, the discussion. Brendan Aronson is in. They were added to the roster for the Nations League Final Four. So I think this is actually a really good roster. Um, I know there are probably some people in this chat who are going to scream that Brendan Vasquez has been just summarily dismissed and, uh, uh, you know, uh, insulted by not being included. Um, you're wrong, and that's fine. <laughs> your boy. Um, this this roster made a lot of sense. It also made sense why Brendan Aronson wasn't in the original roster. He hasn't been great for Union. He's clearly in the group. Um, and also something you have to remember is that this roster is only 23 players because of Nations League rules. So in the past, or if this was a friendly roster, um, you know, I think Haji and Brendan probably would have been called up and he would have had a 25-player camp and, you know, you're fine. Um, both of these replacements made the most sense. Haji has been scoring a bucket of goals a game, it feels like, for Coventry. Coventry's having a good season because of him. And uh, he, like Josh Sargent, also serves a dual purpose of being able to play a little bit on the wing, as does Brendan Aronson. When you look at this roster, the depth on the wing is very clearly a, an issue. Uh, even with Tillman and, and Gio, who could do it, that's not their best position. Um, so actually bringing in Brendan, who has played – on the wing for this team before bringing in Haji who plays a lot on the left side for Coventry does make sense. A uh, bit of a piece of breaking news, I guess is what we would call it. Uh, the jerseys are out. The jerseys are out. Yes. For the uh, 2024 for the Olympics. And it's kind of, it's kind of bomb pop-ish. 
on the blue. Very I, bomb pop -ish. I like the bomb pop blue. You know me as a sucker for frozen desserts. I, I like I like my bomb pops. And, and so the bomb pop is is out. And so you can take a look at it. You have a couple of this one's even there. got the like the melted drip of it, you know, like the hot summer day uh, is kind of melting on it. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, and so it, it's looking pretty cool for me. When you look at this final four with this roster, Calendar, Horvath, Turner and Net, eight defenders, Dest, Lund, McKenzie, uh, Papa Ream, Chris Richards, Anthony Robinson, Miles Robinson, Joe Scally, midfielders. Tyler Adams, Johnny, Weston McKinney, Eunice Musa, Gio Reyna, who uh, understandably might get more minutes playing for the national team in these two matches instead of all the minutes that he has accrued at Nottingham Forest. And then six up top, it is now Brendan Aronson, Balogun, Tillman, Pepe, Polisic, Haji Wright, and Tim Weah. Uh, as we are steaming into the semifinals here in, uh, in, the, nation, in the CONCACAF uh, Nations League, you got Jamaica Thursday in Arlington, Panama and Mexico meeting in the other semifinal for a spot on Sunday. Going into this matchup with Jamaica, what are you what are you staring at here? As now you've brought in two new dudes who, who are uh, on on heaters, as they say in poker. Uh, when you look at this roster going up against Jamaica, what do you see? Well, first off, I think the whole team was on a heater. Unless they scored in like four games straight from the line. Uh, our Pepe gets the game winner for PSV late uh, on the weekend. Balligan's finally scoring goals on occasion. Um, you know, obviously we talked about Haji uh, and a lot of other players. I mean, Weston's having a fantastic year for Juve right now. Um, you know, I think the expectation is you win. That's it. You've won it twice. I think you're finally seeing probably the most talented roster we could get. Mm -hmm. And that's even with the fact that you had some injuries that you replaced with equally talented players. Um, and that's where the U.S. is at right now. As I said, there's a little bit of winger depth issues. However, you still have Tim Way and Christian Pulisic. You still have Christian, I mean, Christian Pulisic is the best winger in CONCACAF right now. Sorry, don't want to debate anyone on that. This is true. <laughs> yeah. He's performing the best for his club, and he still dominates when he comes to the Nations League, especially. Um, and you've got these all these players playing very well with their club. Um, the, the question is for this U S team is who's going to be the guy who, if we are feeling a little pressed by Jamaica, if we're feeling like, you know, we need a goal, uh, things aren't quite going our way. Who's going to be the guy that personally takes us on his shoulders and gets it done. It could be Pulisic. We've seen him try to do that before. It doesn't always work out. Maybe it's Wes who again, been great for UVA and has just been, you know, mercurial at times um and and that's my question is just who's taking that now that said as i always tell people never trust the jamaicans and they are trying to pitch themselves i mean their coach is talking smack and it's like you know we need to humble them again um and that's kind of what if you're the u.s you have to understand that you are i know i love the idea of having your chip on your shoulder but you have to transition to understanding how good you are in relation to the rest of the teams in this region and go out and prove it. It's a little bit like, you know, UGA under Kirby Smart going from, oh, woe is us, we can't recruit some whatever bull crap <laughs> they were selling to themselves. You know? Uh, um, you know, and it's going to, from that to, we're the big dogs, we're the leaders of this conference. Now, granted, Kirby still tries to make, you know, make up lies like someone said they were going to go seven and five, but you have to have the mentality that you're the dominant force. Go prove it. And that's that's going to be key for this team this, this weekend. Only two players from Major League Soccer, Drake Callender and Miles. Are you reading anything to that? Yeah, that they're all, our good players are not playing in Major League Soccer. I mean, wh who else would have been called in? I think Drake Callender is lucky to even be called in, to be quite honest. I don't think he's had uh, – I think he's great – um, no, he's not great. I think he is benefiting from playing with Messi. Mm -hmm. Um, Miami's still not great um, defensively last year, and he he was he let up a lot of goals. It's not always his fault, but um, you know, I, I don't think that there was anything. I don't think he was a like keeper abroad necessarily. You would bring in, especially because you had the U twenty three roster come out as well, and that's where Gaga is. Um, and you know, I he doesn't play for us anymore, so I don't have to you know 
always defend him, but Miles was a little lucky, to be honest, to get called up into this camp when you have other players um, playing at high levels. I don't think I have defended Miles against the Austin Trusty truthers who pretend like Austin Trusty suddenly playing for Sheffield makes him the greatest player in our pool when Sheffield is a bad team with a bad defense and Austin Trusty gets exposed on the reg. But that it's a fair it's a fair quest or question of okay, well, Austin Trusty playing in the Premier League and also had a pretty good season last year with Birmingham Birmingham City. Miles, who honestly wasn't great for Atlanta last year. Um, we also understand that was a little bit because of his recovery from the Achilles injury, but hasn't been great yeah. for Atlanta for a while. So that's a good question. Um, obviously you had CCV basically kind of injured. Um, I think not fit enough to make this trip. If CCV's in the mix, does Miles get called in? Who knows? Um, but I mean, it's just a matter of our good players are in Europe and yeah. that's a good thing. Um, yeah. We need to develop players in MLS, get them to Europe at a time that fits for them and at a club that fits for them. Not Patrick Schulte going to Arsenal because he had one good year for Columbus. <laughs> I was waiting for that one. Uh, cut the promo for me. What do you have going on this week at Soccer for US POD, or are you just lying in wait? Uh, so hopefully tomorrow <laughs> we'll be recording our kind of roster reaction plus Nations League preview, and then next week we'll record about the Nations League. Hopefully we're talking about lifting a third CONCACAF Nations League trophy um, and going three for three in this. I think I feel like at this point, CONCACAF made this competition just for us to win because, I mean, we're doing it all the time. Hey, uh, so what are you up to on Friday? What are you up Good to question, on? John. I don't know. I was going to say. <laughs> all right, Working. So, well, okay. I Maybe I'll be, I'll be there on, I'll be here on Friday morning uh, to talk to you about, again, hopefully a victory over Jamaica. Uh, let me know what you're up to in the 10 o'clock hour on Friday, yes. and we'll figure it out unless you need to bet. Send me the link, and I might drop in. Who knows? There yeah. you go. I will. All right. Uh, soccer for US POD at Bartimus Prime 19. Bart, thanks for hanging out. Y'all be good. Enjoy the win yesterday. It's always good to beat Orlando. Yeah, man. All right. There goes Bart, and that means it's time to bring in Drew and Maddie because it's prem and proper, and uh, kind of prem and proper, uh, but more like uh, FA Cup down here because uh, the question that is on the floor, sir, is have you, in fact, recovered from what happened on the weekend? That is, the, that is literally the first question to the floor this morning for you, Drew. Have you, in fact, recovered from what happened with uh, right. your, your beloved Manchester United? Well, between us, we're friends here. Nobody else is listening. All right. Um, Yes. Uh, I don't know if you can see behind me or not, but we had to call out of sick. We had to call out of work sick today. <laughs> um, I needed a I needed a full day of celebratory um, relaxation, if you will. Um, I had a great I had a great weekend. We had the DSW show on Saturday, so I didn't get to catch too much soccer until the big one, of course, yesterday. And uh, to answer your question, besides calling out of work, you know, there's it's not much. It's not much better than waking up the next day after beating Liverpool. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, uh, uh, how how are you <laughs> feeling? Uh, all right. So let's let's roll through this because I know that you sent me you sent me DMs. You kept me posted on your well being as the match was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, it's two one. Then it gets to two two. What's the, what's your vibe after that ninety minutes and your two two heading to, into an extra thirty? Oh, I mean, you, you can't go any further talking about, you know, going into the extra 30 with bless his heart. Mm -hmm. If if he doesn't have and I know who I know, you know, who I'm talking about Marcus could have sealed the deal with literally micro millimeters seconds to go in the game, pushes it just wide right. And then and then you see some of the subs start to come in and then like all season, you have this sort of. You know, you put your hand on your cheek a little bit like, is he, what is he doing? What, what's going on? And here we go. It's 3-2. And then, okay, well, you know, Anthony ma you know, makes it 3-3 three, three when, it, when it's absolutely a necessity to. And bless his heart, he hadn't scored since, what, 2020, 2023, wow. I feel like. A bless his heart from you early in the segment. Wow. <laughs> I mean, he needs it. And, and then um, – I put out a tweet earlier, and 
I want to roll before I go to the tweets. I want to roll back to when you said I was keeping you updated via DMs. Mm-hmm. I, I want to. One of the reasons why I sent you a DM was because it was three three, and I don't know if you remember. I'm getting kind of um, uh-huh. getting kind of too big for my britches here on these score predictors. And uh-huh. boy, oh boy, about to roll into penalty kicks. I was licking my chops like four in a row. No way. But I digress. Mm-hmm. Um, to end the game, John. Yeah. There was one natural center back on the field one natural fullback on the field and that was Diogo Dallo and Harry Maguire Bruno Fernandez who played on one leg for arguably 45 minutes dropped back to play center back because not much he could do in the middle of the field so let's make you our maestro and then we'll put I don't know what I don't know let's put Anthony out here as our left back and there's a there's a scene right before the second 15 started of Anthony looking at Ten Hag putting two hands to his temples and kind of exploding. Like this guy's lost the plot. He's lost his mind. Like you want me to play there. And then you see, and you see Marcus Rashford kind of kick him into gear. Like, come on, get it. Let's go. we got 15 minutes to go. And again, back to the tweet, absolute masterclass. Bruno Fernandez at the center back with Erickson right in front of him at the eight or the six, whichever way you wanted to do it. But to me, John, the real, real winners of yesterday were Ahmad Diallo and Alejandro Garnacho, who once again shows why he might be one of the best right wingers in world football today. And he can't even drink beer yet. And neither can Ahmad Diallo. And it's just running and sprinting like those two kids did for 120 minutes. Well, uh, Ahmad really just, you know, a cameo for like 40 minutes. And Garnacho did not stop the entire game. And it's for the first time all season, if you're watching and really spectating and really paying attention, I haven't seen the boys put up that that big of a fight for Eric Ten Hag since last season and the Carabao Cup final. Because as we all know, once they lifted that trophy, the season kind of was like a downward spiral. You know, like we got what we came for. uh, Let's rest and recover for next season. But last yesterday afternoon was such a, you know, such a breath of fresh air. And for a change. United led the score sheet in shots and were tied for shots on target. Come on. How about a round of applause for the Reds? There Manchester you. is red. Yeah, of course it is. Uh, Matty Cruz on the ones and twos hanging out with us. Uh, Drew has survived. What's on your mind? <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, I, I when we were coming today, I was like, have we heard from Drew? I was like, is he okay? <laughs> I, we haven't heard anything for a while. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I was like, oh God, I'm nervous. But um, I'm glad you had a great FA Cup weekend. Newcastle surely did not. Um, I don't want to talk about it. I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> knew it was going to happen. But I had hope, you know. I had like a little sliver, and it just all went away. So yeah, mm-hmm. congrats. Yes. <laughs> so all right, and then after the match, so Diallo scores in the final seconds. Mm-hmm. Uh, Liverpool will not get the quadruple. Uh, a a Scandinavian network was asked about uh, asked Jurgen Klopp about his side's intensity dropping in extra time. And I wish I'd pulled the, the audio for this. Jurgen Klopp says, that's a bit of a dumb question. If you see us often, you can ask us the other times why we have so much energy. I don't know how many games we've had recently and how many Manchester United have had that sport. I'm really disappointed about that question, but you thought, obviously, it's good. The reporter then responded, so too many games? Klopp, so he follows up his question, Klopp's mad, follows up his question with a mad Klopp. Oh, you don't think that? Come on, you're obviously not in a great shape, and I have no nerves for you. Niels Christian Fredrickson about the incident, he goes, I was very surprised by it, and the people standing around were scared. They almost were pressed up against the wall like, wow, what the hell just happened here? It continued after what you saw on the TV. He continued down the corridor shouting and screaming at me. I went after him, too, because I thought it was a strange thing. Uh, I was very surprised while some people looked very shocked, and they asked, are you okay? And damn it, I'm okay. So um, Jurgen Klopp was not happy with a particular with a particular question from a, a Scandinavian reporter. So uh, you had that to deal with in post-match, too. Well, I mean, listen, <laughs> I'm – I hate to say this, but it's just it, to me, it's just obvious. And whether you think it's fact or opinion or not, that's just being a crybaby. You got beaten by a team. Wow. You know you gotten beaten by. They wow. Out, you got outcoached by Eric Ten Hag. 
for the wow. second game in a row. Wow. Eric Ten Hag is the first United manager to not lose back-to-back games against Liverpool in for forever. Okay. And you you get asked a question about your fitness level dropping off, and it brings me right back to my point. Ten Hag knew about the fitness level of Manchester United because it's complained about every freaking week by a player league. Oh, we run too much. Do you think they were complaining about running too much yesterday? Look at Garnacho. He didn't stop running. There was no, you know, there was no excuses or any crybaby stuff from Ten Hag. I mean, but that's Klopp. He's animated. Um, the, the, the quadruple is dead. And you're one of your brightest hopes of actually winning a trophy this season, i.e. this FA Cup. Um, it's over with. And you're the one who wanted to retire or, you know, leave Liverpool. I'm, I don't have anything left. So, you know, you made your bed. Now you got to lay in it, pal. It's not Ten Hag's fault. It's not the reporter's fault that your team wasn't fit enough to play 125 straight minutes. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Maddie, I think, might be chasing the audio from the incident. Um, all right. So, Rich Ransom up I was, in Philly. I was trying to. I Listen, I mean, I think, I think from that interview, I think Klopp is upset, obviously. I think in the manner of how it was done um, was not correct. Mm-hmm. I think Klopp was upset. I don't know if I'm the if I'm the if I'm the reporter. I don't know if I asked that next question just because Klopp kind of scares me. Oh, I don't yeah. know if I would. I don't know well, if I would. Uh, well, you know, Maddie, I think you should be scared. You know, when you when you ask uh, certain questions in a certain way, then you end up with the, <laughs> the answer that you're going to get. You know, you just have to yeah. Be and I mean, like, but I don't think the reporter's in the wrong for asking that question. I mean, no. like. Not at all. I, I think, uh, yeah. I mean, like Klopp didn't want to answer the question. Klopp got mad, and that's kind of what it was. I well, think. Of course, he got, of course, he got mad because you know he loses the game the way that he loves the game, and he's not going exactly. to about how it exactly. happened. And so I you think get he's upset. That's a post match. Yeah, he's upset that he lost <laughs> against Manchester United. He's upset. Yep. Rich Ransom up in Philly says he was at a Man U bar. Left in the 80th minute so he could get to Chester Chester for the Union 2 match, thinking it was over. He gets to the parking lot, looks at the score, screaming in his car. Rich Ransom was the good luck charm by leaving early. Thank you, Rich. Come on, United. So then now Dell with the question from Charleston. Should Ten Hag stay? Should he stay? Um, yeah, I do. I mean, I've said this, I've said this all along. At least honestly, at least until the end of the season. And to me, it was never about Eric. It was about the players wanting to perform for him. And whether or not they turned a corner yesterday, the thing with this United team all season long, not so much of the fiscal year 2024, is consistency. Building off of these blocks that you create for yourself, i.e. a 4-3 win at home against a top three team, not just in England, but arguably a top five team in the world football era right now, especially with the coach they have, the players they have, now it's build on it. You go away for the internationals, which I freaking hate. Excuse my language. I can't stand it because now that momentum that you want to build freaking hates it could possibly now be a little bit put at a stopping blocker, a halt, if you will, because what if somebody picks up an injury? Look at Casemiro picked up an injury even before the Brazil. Now he's out for Brazil. Another blow for Eric. But, you know, with Mason Mount back, Lissandro Martinez is supposed to be back. Uh, against Brentford when the Premier League returns. I think it's March 30th is United's next game. Mm -hmm. And we will see. With Lissandro Martinez on the field, Manchester United is a completely different team. Been saying it all year. Everybody knows it. But just to answer that question, yeah, I think Eric should stay. I really do. I would like to see what he can do with a full year of competent transfers. Not him. You know, pan- panic buys because he needed somebody with Enios and Sir Jim and all the new brass that they're putting in place at the helm of Manchester United. I want to see Eric have a chance. I really, really do. I mean, like we said all, the- all along, look at who he has at his display to come off the bench. No offense to Johnny Evans, but Johnny Evans shouldn't be starting for Manchester United in 2024. Cambola shouldn't be his first option off the bench in 2024. Now we're seeing things get healthy and the team, again, the fight that they showed yesterday should make every Man United fan excited, but we need to see a little consistency. But yeah, Eric should stay. Okay. And then uh, Dell with follow-up questions here. 
Uh, Dell wants to know if you're going, and well, first off, but will Sir Jim keep him? I guess that's the first question because you know how things are in any business. Oh, yeah. You're the new boss. You've got, you're the new owner. You're going to bring in your guys. Will Sir Jim, Rat, uh, Sir Jim Ratcliffe keep Eric Ten Hag is probably the deeper question here. Um, I Listen, I'll just build off of my last point. And I'll also throw a, another stat out here. For the amount of games that he's managed, he's won more games than any manager in the history of Manchester United. He's got over a 60% win percentage, and he's only been at the helm for not even two full seasons. So that right there, plus 16 first-team injuries in the first six months of a season – I mean, what, what, what do you want him to do? He cannot pull pull stuff out of a hat. I think the only one of the big mistakes of the season, but it wasn't his fault. He was taking the word from his medical staff was um, Malazia and Shaw were both going to be fit by January. And here we so we can send Sergio Reguillon back. You're going to have two full fit left backs. You don't need a third. I agree. Now, look, you're having to play Lindelof, who cost you a few points in the Premier League because he was forced to play at the left back. You get a full structured new Enios Omar connection, bringing in these new players, young players for the long haul, not two year deals worth, you know, 300,000 a week. So, uh, and, and, and apparently the Kobe money, Kobe may new deal, John is only going to be, I, I know only, but you're usually you're used to seeing these kids get their bag, you know, 200,000 a week. No, Barada is like, no, you're going to get 80,000 a week. Then when you prove it even more, then you can possibly get it right. So I, I, I think Sir Jim, but again, this is just my opinion, guys. I, I really do think he's going to keep him because who's out there? I mean, who's out there? Mm -hmm. uh, we have posted as a public service in the Twitch pitch the one of the links to the actual interview where uh, Jurgen Klopp got a little upset. A little yeah, upset. I, wanna, I also want to comment on the Klopp thing, too, because I want to <laughs> I want to kind of take up for him just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these managers – aren't just master classes when it comes to the drawing board or the training pitch or on the sideline during the 90 minutes. One of the things that Jose Mourinho was so good at is so good at is the deflect mm -hmm. Liverpool just lost to a Manchester United team that they shouldn't have lost Klopp. Now he took the focus off that loss. And now all people are talking about is him blowing up at the media. So that takes away the pressure from the boys. And we all know whether you love them, whether you hate them, Jurgen Klopp, and I truly believe in my heart, I believe that he legit loves and cares for each and every one of his players so much that he'll do whatever it takes to protect him. And that's what I think truly 50-50 was a crybaby, and the other 50% he's trying to deflect and take, the, take off the fact that his FA Cup dreams for his final season as the helm at Liverpool is completely crushed. Manchester City gets Chelsea. Manchester United gets Coventry for the FA. What are the chances of that? <laughs> Gee, who knew that you could possibly have a Manchester Derby to wrap things up? Two uh, years in a row? Yeah, I know, for real. Uh, what else is on your mind before we go? Um, the, the internationals. <laughs> and and honestly, just... You're under the weather. Yeah. <laughs> under the weather. You, yeah. you can tell, too. I, I, I got hydrated earlier. I don't know why I got so much energy. <laughs> um... I, I, my only thing that's on my mind is health. Stay healthy. Mm -hmm. um, Harry Maguire is going. Marcus is going. Uh, Casemiro staying. I know Lissandro Martinez is going with Argentina, but I'm unsure of the amount of playing time he'll get. He's very crucial to that team, just like Maguire is for England. But we just saw Harry come back for the first time in a few weeks, and he only played a cameo, which, again, can we just for about th three seconds? <laughs> Harry Maguire, what an absolute 180 of a season. He has – he shut down Darwin Nunez for 50 minutes all by his dang lonesome yesterday. And I just – but anyways, yeah, I just want 100% health coming back from the internationals. That's really, you know, other than that, I'm, I told you guys, I'm not big on rumors I'm, uh, or the innuendo of stuff. There's, there's two people I take at gospel. And one is the um, publicity writer for Manchester United who releases the stuff for the club and Fabrizio Romano. But until they, until those two don't say anything, you're not going to hear much rumors come out of my mouth. Okay. Uh, so that's Drew. That's another round of Prem and Proper. How can folks follow you on the media that is social, sir? Uh, at Dickinson JR18 on X and Drewski18 with five eyes on Instagram. 
five eyes. And Del, to answer your question, uh, as of right now, Drew will be actually over in England by August when the match is at the fairgrounds at Williams Bryce. That that's that's a hopefully. That's a if, hopefully. if if the government is still dragging their rear ends, I've already got a hotel reserved, Dell, and just waiting to see about tickets. So I'll probably won't get tickets to like the week of. I know that'll be expensive, but yeah, they I are. will be at William Bryce Stadium if I have not moved. So you yeah. can you can take that to the bank, brother. So so if he's on this side of the Atlantic, the answer is he'll be at the fairgrounds and hanging out with uh, people like Dell. If the governments have cooperated and he has his passport and he gets the okie doke to go, then he's going to be heading over to the uh, the original country on the other side of the Atlantic. And he's going to be part of our soccer over there coverage uh, when he goes over to England and gets that out. right, mate. Yes, exactly. All right. Be well, my friend. We'll catch up with you soon. And uh, Prem and Proper coming up in the international window on Friday. Thanks for hanging out. There he, on Friday. there he goes. That's Drew. So that that's Drew. And uh, I'm, Maddie, I'm just glad that Drew is actually physically recovered or recovering <laughs> that he had to take the, the mental health day. <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. I listen, I should have taken a mental health day with how badly Newcastle did, but it's fine. I, I at this point, I'm used to it. It it was Man City. I knew it was going to happen, <laughs> but I had hope that maybe just maybe we could do it. But we didn't. And no. we we fell on our faces, but it's OK. It's yeah. fine. You now we you just go up and we have to play against um, if I can pull up the thing that I want to pull up. Yeah. Um then we go up next, not this week, obviously, because of international duty. But um, next week on the 30th, mm -hmm. we play against West Ham. Yes. So uh, you, you got stuff you got to take care of in the middle of the table. So uh, right now, looking at the Premier League table, they have not made the four-point adjustment. Obviously, Nottingham Forest is looking to appeal the uh, judgment from earlier this morning. No official word yet from the Premier League on the four-point deduction that was uh, brought to us by our friend Will Unwin over at The Guardian. When it does become official, and yes, Nottingham Forest will appeal, Nottingham Forest will drop to 21 points. They will be one point from safety. Luton will be at 22. They will be safe and out of the relegation zone, three points behind Everton, who is still waiting their second uh, verdict on a separate set of uh, penalties as well. So that's... Uh, that's where we are when it comes to uh, activity in the Premier League. And uh, let's see. So we got about 10 minutes. And uh, if there's anything that we didn't talk about, obviously we'll talk about it tomorrow. We'll go through everything starting at 9.05. Interesting news out of League One. Uh, you know the, the cup that League One is having, uh, the, the, inter, the intra-league competition that they're having. Remember, they trimmed their number of regular season matches and they've inserted this cup tournament with uh, with the, the activity in USL League One. Jägermeister has agreed to a multi-year, and this is how it was phrased by USL, a multi-year entitlement partnership for the new USL Jägermeister Cup. And uh, playing into all of the all of the puns. Subheading: New USL League One clubs will battle for quote a shot at glory, end quote, during this new and exciting in-season cup competition kicking off on April 27. So in-season World Cup-style tourney creates additional matches of consequence in the annual calendar, non-traditional modifications to encourage attacking soccer, penalty shootout, shootouts to determine match winners during the group stage, goals scored as the first tiebreaker in the group standings. And so uh, you end up with a paragraph from Leo Neal, president of USL League One, and uh, Jägermeister is now attached with the, quote, a shot at glory. Insert Jägermeister pun here. Uh, so Jägermeister is now attached to the new cup competition inside USL League One that came out this morning. David with a question. How did the Rhode Island FC opener go? Did anyone follow that at all? Rhode Island FC was down 1-0. They scored late. Late, later than late to get a 1-1 draw. And the crowd obviously at uh at bryant at at, uh, at burn stadium was out of its mind no real shock there but uh you ended up with uh, a one one draw for rhode island fc and so the next time that uh that uh, michael parkhurst is on the show we obviously have to discuss what happened there 
with that matchup, the one, one draw with uh, Rhode Island FC and, and New Mexico United, New Mexico United scored in the 68th minute and it was one nil. And then Chris Gloucester gets the goal. Uh, it was an own goal. Gloucester uh, gets uh, credited with the OG, but it was an OG in the 90, that 90 plus two. So down one nil. Rhode Island FC scores at 90 plus two for the home opener in front of 52 52. There's got to be something there with that. But in front of 52 52 in Rhode Island at Burns Stadium on the campus of Bryant University, 1 1 draw, Rhode Island FC, New Mexico United. The, uh, the atmosphere. Uh, from all indications, looked pretty bananas, and it was uh, it looked it was really cool. Yeah, Dell, it was uh, Rhode Island was a sellout. You probably the most important guy or individual at the uh, at Burns Stadium on Bryant University's campus. The most important person probably was the fire marshal to try and figure out how many folks could be let in. Do you sell 5,252 tickets? I like the I like the numerology there that's attached to it. 5,252 was the announced attendance. An own goal at 90 plus two gives Rhode Island a point in their home opener. And uh, our friends out west who are having their uh, morning cup of coffee and following along, watch that game and convince me lower league soccer is meaningless. You can't. Impossible. Dell reminding us that Charleston tied at Oakland. Two ties to start the season. First home match Saturday against New Mexico United. And so what we're also trying to do is figure out how we can fit in our USL Championship Review Preview Show and the USL League One Review Preview Show into our stuff that we do normally on a weekly basis because we are running around at about 90 miles an hour. So we're going to try and figure out how to put our League One show and our championship show into the rotation, and that'll... uh, take care of your your reviews and your previews 20 minutes at a time or a half hour at a time i think by the time both shows are done uh for your listening pleasure but to know it was a fun weekend across the board tomorrow obviously we'll get into all the other stuff if there's anything on the table that we didn't get into this morning we can talk about that tomorrow shooter can still be mad at the new england revolution and we'll get into that everything with atlanta united lower divisions all that kind of stuff that's what tuesday thoughts are all about going across the board and letting everybody know what else is on your mind now that we will have had a, a day to think about everything there. Uh, in uh, Also in USL Championship, Blue City won at El Paso. El Paso played three matches in a week. Loudon got a win over North Carolina at Segra. Indy 11 won on the road at Memphis 901. We talked about the draw with Rhode Island, New Mexico United. Sacramento won on the road, going from one end of the world to the other to, to uh, beat the Miami FC. Not a Miami FC, but the Miami FC. Orange County goes to Highmark and beats Pittsburgh 2-0. They're planning on some stadium additions and renovations at Highmark to, uh, to, add, uh, to add spots. And uh, so more people can see Bob Lilly yelling uh, after a match is over. Uh, <laughs> Tampa and San Antonio, a 2-2 draw. Detroit City won at Widener Field in beautiful downtown Colorado Springs 2-1. FC Tulsa beat Vegas Lights 3-1. Monterey Bay 1-0 over the defending champs in Phoenix at Cardinal. And Oakland and Charleston Battery 1-1. Next matches are this Saturday. Interesting note for Oakland, by the way. Oakland, the Roots, and the Soul are going to be playing their uh, soccer next year at the Oakland Coliseum. I hope that the plumbing is fixed. I hope that the, uh, the rats and the raccoons have at least been given their own separate space to where they're not dripping into the press box. And, and hanging out with the, the out-of-town media. So uh, it's a great idea while Oakland works on the idea of the modular stadium that they were thinking about in the parking lot, but it looks like they're going to be inside Oakland Coliseum next season and playing their matches there. So a uh, really, interesting, really interesting thing there that happened with the Roots and the Soul next season at Oakland Coliseum. So very, very you, can't, cool. you can't just ignore the fact that just rats and stuff were falling from the ceiling. That's no, 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 no. Well, that's the thing. It's like the, they, the, the A's have no interest in being there. And that's why, you know, they really weren't doing a whole lot of renovating and any, you know, any John Fisher, not really doing a whole lot to help the city out. The city wasn't all that interested in the A's. A's aren't all that interested in the city, so the the mutual uh, disrespect between you know with both parties 
Oakland's trying to leave and go to Vegas. They might be playing in Sacramento. They might be trying to to, uh, grovel their way back and end up playing in the Oakland Coliseum next year. We don't know because the 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 whole Vegas thing for the Oakland A's really doesn't seem to be working out that well. So, uh, So we'll see. But a great announcement for the Roots and the Soul that they are going to be a part of uh, the Oakland Coliseum. Uh, gossip rumor and innuendo, what to watch, and Maddie's final thoughts before we go. Uh, what to watch and where to watch it today. Just one game. One game to watch. And it's in the Argentine Copa de la Liga at 8.15. Union Santa Fe and Central Cordoba in uh, the Argentine Copa de la Liga. It's on Paramount+. Plus. And uh, also, if you don't have Paramount+, Plus, because obviously business will pick back up on a Tuesday, where you end up with Women's Champions League, USL Soccer. You've got the Open Cup first-round matchups that uh, that are attached to folks. South Georgia Tormenta tomorrow is playing FC America CFL Spurs. That's going to be hell to put on a, on a jersey. Savannah Clovers are supposed to be playing tomorrow night. Tormenta is supposed to be playing FC America CFL Spurs tomorrow night. So we have five matches in the Open Cup tomorrow. So Open Cup is another story that we'll be chasing tomorrow. Uh, We don't know about Open Cup on Wednesday. There are supposed to be nine matches on Open Cup on Wednesday. And we don't know if the uh, Open Cup on Wednesday involving... Apotheos and uh, Georgia Lions is, we still don't know. So uh, we'll keep you posted because NISA came out with an announcement that they were postponing the beginning of the regular season because of, uh, a, couple of a couple of the new, newer clubs, uh, some out on the West Coast and one in the state of Georgia, which was Georgia Lions. We don't know where Georgia Lions are when it comes to roster construction. We don't know where they are when it comes to player eligibility. So Apotheos is supposed to be on Wednesday night playing at at Silverbacks Park against a team from NISA that we don't know a whole lot about. We don't know what their status is, and we'll keep you posted on that particular matchup. God bless the U.S. Open Cup. You wouldn't have stories like that otherwise. So we'll, we'll let you know. Wednesday also is match one of our matches this week on the high school side. Our Tuesday night throwdown is now a Wednesday night mashup with Midtown and Villarica out at Villarica. We get to catch up with our friends out there in uh, Douglas County, and that'll be fun, 530 and 730. Match on Friday night as well, so we'll keep you posted on all of that. Sorry that we couldn't make it down to Perry to uh, catch up with our friends down there with Griffin and Perry, but uh, with the weather being what it was, uh, it Really, they had a lot of discussions down there, and they ended up postponing the matches. And so, obviously, when it comes to the playoffs and the postseason, we want to go down there and catch up with our friends in the four, seven, eight. The the girls team, by the way, if you haven't followed lower classifications in Georgia high school soccer, the girls team has outscored their opponents to date eighty one to three. Wow. 81 to three. I think there were six matches so far where they have uh, scored more than the 10, uh, the 10 goal difference. And that's when you call a match is when you get to the 10 goal difference. I think they've scored double digits six times this year in their wins. So 81 81 scored only three surrendered. And when uh, we get to the playoff time, we'll catch up with the boys and girls as they're trying to chase back to back region champs. So just, just the one match today. And that is in, uh, the Copa de la Liga on Paramount Plus. If you don't have Paramount Plus, or if you want to sign up to Paramount Plus, you can do that. If you want to sign up for real, uh, real degenerate soccer watching, you go to our friends at Fanatis, FNTZ.co slash soccer down here. You get CDO for the fans, Taze, uh, Libertadora, Sudamericana, all the BNs, Liga One Max, Liga One Max Pro, all that stuff in one place. Uh, Nuestra Tele, it's there at Fanatis. Jason got me hooked. I blame him. All right. Gossip, rumor, and innuendo before we go. And any last thoughts from Maddie on the board for anything that we have either discussed, yet to discuss, or that she wants to add on to? All right. So, Monday gossip. Here we go. Liverpool have joined Arsenal, Manchester United, showing an interest in Dortmund winger Danielle Malin. 
David Moyes planning a new bid for Harry Maguire in the summer. Three-letter paper, take the information at your own peril. Same for Marcus Rashford, set to snub a potential move to PSG and stay at Manchester United. Atletico Madrid have inquired about a summer move for Mason Greenwood. Manchester United have set a 50 million pound asking price. Greenwood's Manchester United teammates have backed him to play again for uh, the Red Devils again after his loan spell at Hitafe, three-letter paper. Uh, Chelsea target Lenny Yoro wants to join Real Madrid, although Lille are asking for 100 million euro for the French defender, who is only 18. Newcastle will be forced to sell one of their key players this summer in an effort to balance their books. Remember, PSR is going to be in play for Newcastle because they are already two-thirds of the way to the number after only one year in this current PSR cycle. Christian Eriksen is going to leave Manchester United at the end of the year if a suitable offer comes in for the midfielder. Brighton keeping tabs on Arsenal's Reese Nelson before a potential summer move. Also maintaining an interest in Leicester's Kiernan Drewsbury Hall after failing with a January bid for the midfielder. Inter Milan, confident Latar Martinez is going to sign a new deal. Fabrizio Romano, tier one source. Olivier Giroud, keep an eye out for this one. Olivier Giroud wants an MLS move to either Los Angeles or New York when his contract with AC Milan expires at the end of the season. What do you want to bet he goes to LAFC and turns into Gareth Bale 2.0? That's just me. Liverpool closely monitoring Ajax's 18-year-old Netherlands defender, Jarl Hato. Manchester City in advance talks. And keep an eye on this one, too. Manchester City in advance talks to sign 14-year-old USA youth forward Kevin Sullivan who is part of the Philadelphia Union, but is yet to sign a professional contract. So what you could see, and this is what has uh, been mentioned, is that Sullivan would be signed by Manchester City. Obviously, he's 14. He'd be loaned to Lommel SK when he turns 16, although nothing is yet determined. He could not play for City until he turns 18. Regarded as one of the very best young players in the world, once again, yet to sign a professional deal. Philadelphia has been working to keep Sullivan, including making the best ever homegrown offer ever extended, according to two sources. Sullivan in negotiations with City. Philly would have been open to agreeing a deal in which he could have stayed with the Union until he turned 18. Sullivan led the USU 15 to the win in the CONCACAF U15 championships, earned golden ball for best player of the tournament. Older brother Quinn, currently a part of the first team. Quinn turns 20 this month. And uh, Sullivan started the GA Cup last spring and uh, 13 played for the Union's U15s who beat Arsenal and Real Madrid en route to the final named GA Cup Best 11. So keep an eye on Kevin Sullivan getting signed by Manchester City, being loaned out and could possibly be loaned back. If he goes to Lommel, let's just say he goes to Lommel. But then New York City FC knocks on the door. Um, hello, Lamo, Lamo SK, NYC. You could end up seeing, as Rich says, he was at the U2 match on Sunday. Lit and kids super cool and nice. Just you could see, just to, just for the sake of argument, a situation where Sullivan or Cavan is loaned, signed by City, loaned to Lamo. But then all of a sudden, Lommel's season's over, and you want to get Kevin Sullivan reps. So what do you do? Nick Cushing is on line one. He could end up basically being signed by City, loaned to Lommel. Lommel's season's over, loaned to NYCFC because of the multi-club model. So just keep that in mind. Keep that in mind going forward. Maddie, last thoughts before we go. A great weekend of soccer. Excited for the Open Cup to kick off. I love the Open Cup and it's going to be fun. It's going to be chaotic and it's going to be fun because that's what the Open Cup is. It is so fun. So I'm excited. It's going to be a great time and yeah, just the, excited for another full week of soccer. Yep. Looking forward to it. And once again, we've got matches on Wednesday and Friday on the high school side. It is Atlanta United at Toronto on Saturday. So Jason will be in transit Friday. So it'll be me and Maddie on the ones and twos for the matches on Friday. Sunday, it is Atlanta United 2 Carolina Core. I forgot to ask you about your thoughts about the twos in their first match of the year against OCB. Yeah. I mean, I personally, I, even though it wasn't the win that, or it wasn't a win at all, and it wasn't like what we had hoped for the Open, I was very impressed with the performance of the team. 
I still thought, I mean, there were so many great opportunities and I think it shows the resilience of the twos in being able to come back. And, you know, and I think um, one thing that um, Coach Cook even said afterwards that I really stuck with was, you know, they are going to be taking things that they did well in the game and reinforcing that and then trying to get more players in better positions in that final third because that was the issue. It was not being able to get players up there in the box to get it in the back of the net. So we'll see what happens when Carolina Core comes to town. Another 3 o'clock kick Sunday afternoon. Pre-game show at 2.30. And we will have the post-game show a half hour brought to you by our friends at Kaiser Permanente. That is a Monday. Thanks to everybody who hung out with us. Thanks to uh, Maddie Cruz and the ones and twos. Thanks to Jarrett with the Irish goodbye. Thanks to Bart, who was in Nashville for his weekly segment because he got to go see Casey Musgraves. And thanks, as always, to Abe Gordon, who comes in early first thing on a Reaction Monday. Tomorrow, once again, whatever's on your mind, and we can uh, break everything down for you all across everything, anything, and Choice D, all of the above. So since uh, Maddie is here, Derek, uh, glad to see you here as well. Thanks to everybody who dropped in this morning. Thanks to everybody who's watching on all of our different social media channels. Maddie, since you're here and you've made it through the show, go ahead and send us home for yet another week. Thank you guys so much for listening to today's episode. Because it is the end of the show, that means John gets to do this. Mucha plata, y'all.